Thank you for joining the Minding Your Brain program. Today, we're going to talk about the challenges brain injury survivors have with emotional regulation, otherwise known as mood swings, which is debilitating effect, side effect of brain injury, and leaves sometimes uncontrollable or impulsive behavior. My name is Candace Gant, and I'm the executive director and founder of the Mind Your Brain Foundation. My guest today is Chris Schaub. Chris has worked in post-acute brain injury rehabilitation since 1995 with a focus in neurobehavioral programming for individuals with all levels of neurological impairment. After earning a master's degree in behavioral analysis from Temple University, he received his board certification in behavior analysis in 2004 and is currently a behavior analyst with ReMed, a resource available in Paoli, serving individuals with complex neurobehavioral needs. Welcome, Chris. It's great to have you with us. Thank you for joining today. Good morning, Candace. I'm so happy to be here. Chris, what I'd like to do is start out, as we do with all of our programs, talking about the brain injury population, that 5.3 mm -hmm. million Americans that suffer still today mm -hmm. with brain injuries. And I would like you, if you could, to tell us a little bit about those deficits that that population has, the invisible sure. population. Sure. And it's really true, Candace. And the gamut, in my experience at ReMed uh, over 25 years, has taught me an incredible amount. Um, and it's really folks like you that help get the word out, so really thank you so much for having me. Um, but it can really run a gamut across a wide spectrum of type and severity of injury. Um, and those things can affect every part of someone's function and therefore every part of their day. And so our job is to, as clinicians, is to kind of survey all of those areas of impairment that can range from physical needs to cognitive needs to communication needs um, to needs to get back into the community and reintegrate, reintegrate back into home or work. Um, and really, obviously, especially in the case of mood and uh, emotional dysregulation, address those issues. Thank you. Yes, and let's unpack that a little bit. Mm -hmm. What are those emotional regulations or, or sensitivity to emotion? What does that look like? Well, it, it can look like a lot of different things, Candace. We can see folks who sometimes are withdrawn um, from interactions, perhaps, or maybe isolative. We can see folks who are maybe, maybe disorganized or confused or preoccupied, all the way up through folks who get more maybe um, upset and become angry and maybe become threatening or demanding. Um, and really, my job as a behavior analyst is to look at those things and help the team look at those things in a really comprehensive and integrated way. Uh, and one of the tools I brought along with me today is called the, we've, we've called it the stability triangle. Mm -hmm. um, and what it really does is help organize all of the variables that we look at that affect an individual surviving a brain injury. Um, and it starts at the top with, with medical stability because we can appreciate that people experience pain or they might experience disruption sure. in sleep. Um, we also have folks who have things like um, vestibular disorders, which is something that affects your sense of space, um, your body. It can affect your sensitivity to noise or to light or even your ability to move in a stable way. Um, medications, we have to take all those things into account in terms of someone's well-being. Uh, and then we would you know, move around to where there's you know, behavioral issues or cognitive issues where people have you know, maybe executive function and there's problems like you mentioned, impulsivity is a big mm -hmm. one where judgment mm -hmm. is impaired and people are concerned about someone's safety or the type of at-risk behaviors they might engage in. Or it could just be somebody who needs a, to take on some tools and strategies to get through their day, whether that's a schedule or a, some sort of technology to prompt them and remind them of things. And then I think that, you know, the third part of that triangle is really the activity plan. So we really have to understand, help this person understand their injury and the people around them understand it as well, as you know, because yes, it affects not just... training for, yeah, the whole community. It's the not whole just the person with the brain injury that's affected. I mean, it's everyone that's affected, right? A whole household, perhaps yes. a community or a, a work environment's affected. And so that activity plan has to really reflect the person's relative skills and capacities and, and has to be meaningful to them and help them get back in, you know, to life in a productive and satisfying way. That's great. But we all have emotional mm -hmm. issues and um, perhaps emotional regulation mm -hmm. challenges. Is that different from this population? Just <laughs> no, I, I, I joked when we were corresponding in, in advance of this. I said, you know, I've been married for 20 years. I have a 15-year-old daughter and 12-year-old <laughs> son, and I've learned a lot. taught me a lot about emotional regulation. And Indeed. So, so typically, of course, all of us experience, you know, changes in emotion, but, but generally it's within a certain bandwidth. You know, we get excited. We, we might get overly excited for a period of time, but our, you know, 
Now we're able to kind of regulate that and bring it back into more of a baseline. We might be sad or down for a period of time, right. but generally right. our you know our, our our intact you know brains and and and, and uh, neurochemistry is regulated so that we're sort of able to kind of achieve that balance and stay within a certain bandwidth. Unfortunately, for survivors of brain injury, that can be a much different story. Um, there can be moments that are really intense. Mm -hmm. um, there can be moments that are really uh, intensely high or intensely low in terms of maybe there's too much behavior, there's a lot of yelling and upset or overwhelm even. Um, there can also be periods of time where people are more, like I said, withdrawn or isolated. And so, and it's hard for that individual to regulate that. And those moods can be influenced by the things I mentioned previously, maybe by how they're feeling. Yeah. Um, you know, how they're feeling that day, if they're feeling tired or if they're feeling, you know, distracted or preoccupied. So it can really be a challenge. Yeah, indeed. So there must be triggers everywhere yeah. that, that mm -hmm. brings on this and the change in, that quickly. Yeah, and triggers is a really interesting word because I think there are triggers, you know, my, part of my job as a behavior analyst is to look at both the inside and the outside story. So I think about the things that maybe that individual is experiencing as a result of their injury that might trigger certain emotions, maybe upset or sense of loss, you know, those uh, kinds of yes. things. Or just even a sense of, you know, maybe they can't pay attention because they've got a headache that they're having or they've got, you know, they become overwhelmed vestibularly and maybe they can't focus on a task that they're engaged in. Um, and then, you know, so, so are there are many, many things that can affect people in that kind of way. Um, and it's our job to really help them understand to the best of their abilities, understand what those things are um, and learn to manage them either independently with mm -hmm. support or in some other cases in my experience, it's been necessary that the responsibility for that kind of programming really falls on the people around that person. Because it may be that Indeed. the level of impairment is so, is so severe that they're, they're not able to kind of achieve that kind of independent self-management. And do they? And if you're on the lighter spectrum, mm -hmm. although all brain injuries are, we know, are severe. Sure, of course, uh, in, of course. In a uh, de description of their of mm -hmm. their deficits, but do they do they understand that there's an emotional issue? That, do they understand? Do they have self awareness right. that this is a challenge for them? Because right. how do you how do you really attack this right. if if you don't recognize that there's right. there's challenges? Well, one thing you, it made me think of when you, when you mentioned that is you know in, in our work there's I know there's mild and moderate and severe sort of categorizations of injury, but there's no such thing as a mild or a moderate brain injury. I mean, even a mild, someone who's lost consciousness maybe briefly and been in and out of the ER that might come home later that night or the next morning and, and, and you know, got a medical clearance, so to speak, at the time, right. um, might experience a residual symptoms that, that persist, you know, maybe confusion or fatigue or irritability, those kinds of things. Um, and then so there's, there's, there's need to kind of address that clinically. And to the extent that someone can become aware of those things, that mm -hmm. becomes a real key variable. I mean, awareness is the hallmark trait of brain injury going back to the early 80s when they were really beginning to study it more intensively. Uh, and it is correlated with outcomes. So I think the, and awareness isn't necessarily something that, you know, a couple days or a couple weeks after somebody's injured, they become aware or not. It's mm -hmm. a process. You know, it really is a process and an evolution. So you're really trying to promote awareness all the time for folks by teaching them about or bringing them into certain experiences and trying to help them pay attention to what's going on. And I know we'll talk in a, in a few minutes about a, a specific tool that we've kind of worked yes, on yes. to help people learn to do that more independently. I'd like to share that with the, with sure. the audience if we could, because if there's tools to, to do that self-regulation, sure. can we provide those with it? Can sure. we help them in that Sure. In that area. So, so the way we've, I'll make one more comment about the awareness and then I'll, then I'll move on to this mm -hmm. tool that we'll mention. So, uh, you know, in the awareness um, literature, there, there, are, there are sort of three levels. There's anticipatory, there's emergent, and there's intellectual. Mm -hmm. um, and there are varying levels of uh, anticipatory is, is really that someone can kind of anticipate what's going to happen or where they might have trouble and really then engage in a plan to manage that ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's obviously a, a sort of at the top. You know, in the middle is this level of emergent awareness where people understand that they have difficulty but can't always plan in advance to manage that difficulty. Right. And then intellectual is people are, are able to acknowledge they have an injury but don't really understand how it affects them. Um, and have difficulty so correspondingly with, with self-management, I think the anticipatory folks are able to kind of work on a plan that's been developed with a treatment team, of course. I'm, I'm lucky mm -hmm. enough to work as a part of a, a pretty broad interdisciplinary team with speech therapists and occupational therapists and physical therapists and neuropsychologists and drug and alcohol counselors. Wow, and collaborative <laughs> effort. It really is, it and is it's very, team. very integrated, and that's yes. where that model came from, how integrated things are. It's really about, and all our consulting physicians, whether it's neuropsychiatry for medication management or physiatry for 
are kind of working on because it, it could be things like even bowel and bladder management or tone and spasticity management that are creating pain oh and things goodness. like that. There's met and mobility deficits. All of those things have to be integrated into this comprehensive plan for the individual to ultimately be successful. Um, and so what we would do then is we would work on this, if someone's in the middle and they're sort of more aware but not able to kind of act in a way, they might need a, they, we call them kind of co-managers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they're happy to move through their day, they have a little bit of help and some scripts maybe and maybe yeah. a schedule to follow that's been worked on with the team. Mm -hmm. um, and they can be quite independent within the scope of that routine because the predictability is really important you know, the predictability of that routine. Um, and then for folks that are, you know, more impaired and have, have more profound awareness deficits, it really is becomes the greater responsibility of the people around them to help them manage their day, to make sure that things are kind of two steps ahead planned help. out. Yeah, they need yeah, help. They, they, they need they, to be they need set up. They need their caregiver to support Yeah, they need things to the table to be set for them. And, yes. and in that situation, they can be really successful. And that might be something as simple as an approach that people take. It might be as simple as prescribed breaks. Like we might, we've had folks who are only in sessions for 10 or 15 minutes and, and we don't wait for them to ask for a break. Some people will learn to, but if they can't, then we'll take a break and we'll know that that's a time to break. And so there's different, you know, variations on similar themes of pacing and, and routine. So yeah, that's that's yeah. really yeah. It, it it sounds complicated, <laughs> but, but and I know that there's a strategy, which is a sure. beautiful thing because sure. that that allows you to be able to probably um, assess the progress they're making right. based right. on some of that. Absolutely. So can you tell us some of the tools? Sure. That maybe there's somebody in our audience that, that has this challenge. What, yeah. could they, what, could, what could they do for self-help? Is there a way to do that? Sure, absolutely. So, so the, the tool that we've developed over you know, probably the last decade or so or two is called the escalation chain. And that, that's one that I typically start, but I also, the, the thing to, to note about that is it's very much, in, everything we're doing is integrated. So I can't do anything as a clinician on my own. I mean, I can on my own, but mm -hmm. I, I benefit from the expertise of the other team members. So the escalation tool looks graphically like a set of stairs. Um, with a little, like a, like a, on a little graph. Yes. Um, and so what we want to think about is that basically um, as, the, as the steps get higher, mm -hmm. um, someone's level of escalation is increasing. Um, so that might look like, and so, it, and we, we want to make sure, because I hear from a lot of families, they say it feels like it goes from zero to 100 in a second. And they have an emotional just outburst. Just like that, it just boom, it just yes. bursts. And that's often what people see and experience. But when you get a chance to kind of work with someone more directly, you realize there's typically a series of events that takes place that are sometimes very subtle and private, maybe mm -hmm. even internal, like mm -hmm. you become distracted or preoccupied or you start to feel your pain intensify. And that would be something that you or I would have a hard time observing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then otherwise there might be more obvious things like someone might storm away or someone might you know, disengage or refuse to talk to you any further, things like that, that obviously indicate they're more agitated or more upset mm -hmm. or more overwhelmed. And from a caregiver, do, do they approach that situation? How do you, how do you suggest that sure. you, we, we understand it right. and uh, approach it respectfully? Yeah, that's a great question, Candace, because that's so important. It has to be collaborative. It really has to be. And in the escalation chains that I work on with folks, they're, they're based on their language. It's not my language. It's how they describe being upset, which you can imagine runs quite a gamut. Yes. So it's that top part of self-monitoring, like the things you need to kind of pay attention to, the changes in, in your behavior, whether that's an internal, like a feeling or thought, mm -hmm. or an external things you're doing or not doing that you typically do that indicate you're more or less escalated, right? So you start out as we all try to start the day in a nice calm way, yes. right? Do yes. our best. But sometimes things change and become preoccupied. And the idea is over time, if we don't attend to those things, they can contribute to escalation. So on the bottom of the chain is something Thing called self-regulation, which works mm -hmm. in concert with self-monitoring. So you pay attention to what's going on and then you know what to do when it's happening. Um, and the earlier on in the tool, people tend to have more options uh, because you're calmer, just like I might. If I'm a little frustrated, I might be able to listen to music or read a book or do a task and that all makes sense. And, and again, these tools come from working with the team members and the other the other disciplines to try to figure out what is it that helps manage pain what's calming or manage, oh yeah, them. what's calming mm -hmm. or soothing or right. relaxing, distracting, all of those things. And then also, as you mentioned, Candace, what's as important, I think, is that the people around them, whether that's the treatment team or the family, plays a role as well. Because right. when people get really escalated, sometimes they benefit from support from others to be reminded, like, hey, are you okay? You know, do you want to take a break? Those kinds of things can be really, really important. So yes. that tool is a highly individualized tool, but it's also very, very collaborative. Arrive at. And so let's unpack it a little bit because mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by sure. this whole idea that we can we can monitor it ourselves and make adjustments mm -hmm. to our behavior mm -hmm. in advance of getting to that top step. Right, correct. And so you suggested earlier that the music or mm -hmm. there's some calming 
opportunity that mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. that you you understand and, and you can use that right uh, what what happens if you get past that right then Great. what's the next step so so I'm calm I'm listening to music I, I recognize mm -hmm. then I'm climbing that ladder right right so I'm using these tools to keep uh, to, to manage mm -hmm. my responses but then what happens if it escalators so right. what's my step two right so so really it looks like again they're individual based on how the person's inputs been um, and those other options are typically you know usually start with like taking a break like someone stepping oh. aside and and also then as you mentioned calming there's a lot of great apps out there like calm is an app for mm -hmm. example uh, there's unpaid and paid versions of these things there's other things that are you know we're, we're sort of getting into this now we have a we have one of our therapists does biofeedback so we use that as a way oh, to people great. be for people to be sensitive to changes that they might not detect in an you obvious know, way. Right, you don't and know it. There's even some apps on phones that will, you know, use sort of finger um, temperature monitoring and, and let you know whether you're, you know, where that relates, or even like a regular fitness tracker, if your pulse rates up, those sort of things might indicate that your body's more activated. Um, so we try to teach people to pay attention to as many things as they can and then know what to do. Um, as they get more upset, the options typically become a little more limited, of course, right. because like any of us, when we're really upset, I'm not able to sit and do something not very rational. calm. No, I'm, I might have to take yeah, a walk, so or I might have to call somebody that I really, really trust, oh, and tools. they might just have to listen to me vent and know that I'm just calling to vent, and then after I get that first part out, I'm ready to start to work my way back down. So it's a very dynamic, kind oh. of fluid um, skill set, and, and again, we start by having people kind of rate their moods pretty regularly through the day, you know, to really start to be in touch and pay attention. Yes, so so they would have actually a document to say, Correct. this is what we mm -hmm. have worked together Correct. to, to uh, give you the opportunity mm -hmm. to de-escalate. Yeah, this. so that tool that actually popped up on the screen, Candace, mm -hmm. would be something that would, you know, we would pull away those other descriptors and things, which are more guideposts for completing it, and then we'd start to populate it for that person. So what's calm this feel like? This works, that yeah, works. Yeah, what are you thinking yes. about when you're calm? Like, enjoy the day, feel good, enjoy feeling good. Okay, so the next step is maybe you get preoccupied or you start to ruminate. You know, rumination's mm -hmm. a, a, a big thing because people with brain injuries oftentimes can have difficulty with something called perseveration or rumination, and that's kind of stewing and brewing, if you will. Yes. Sort of like, you know, something gets stuck and you, you can't re and then beyond that, people might, again, as I said, maybe their tone changes in their voice. And, and that's why the loved ones around them sometimes are also very good because they pick up on these little changes. Oh, indeed. Uh, and, they, and, it's, and it's all wrapped around and oriented towards the goals of that person, like being more calm mm -hmm. and more stable and ma having a plan to manage your overwhelm and upset really helps you, you know, progress in your recovery and rehabilitation first and foremost. Mm -hmm. It helps you return to home more successfully and re-engage with your family and right. loved ones and, and ultimately, you know, helps you return to work or some other kind of satisfying activity plan. Yeah, that's what I was just considering yeah, sure, too. You, really, you have to be in a, in a self-management mm -hmm. um, arena mm -hmm. to be able to to uh, reach out to the community and to right. be an integral part of that community. Right, right, exactly. Because without those kind of guardrails in place, people yes. are, are going to experience difficulties in those situations. And, and in the community where I work in Brainerd, we're, we're incredibly understanding about it. I mean, that's part of being a professional in this, in this mm -hmm. population is understanding that this is what people experience. I've had a lot of family members apologize to me about how their loved oh. ones act and they say, please, you don't, you don't need to apologize. We're, this is a place of understanding where we, we know that these things are happening and we appreciate that that's the reasons why this individual is here mm -hmm. and we're here to help them sort of you know reimagine a plan and, and get back out so and the caregivers play such an important role oh so gosh. I'm thinking the caregivers themselves need that list mm -hmm. so uh, if I see someone and it could be it could be a, an, a fellow employee mm -hmm. it could be somebody in the supermarket mm -hmm. that just is triggered right. by something right. that that activates that's their, exactly right um, um, their emotional regulation and so if you have that list as a caregiver, mm -hmm. you can recognize the escalation. Absolutely. And then what role do they play? Do they remind that person or do they step back and let it play out and let that person That's manage? That's a terrific question, Candace. And, and we try to inform that the answer to that question and all the work we do. Because some folks are okay if you walk up and sort of say, hey, are you okay? Do you, you want to talk for a yes. minute? Um, you know, and some people are perfectly willing to engage in that conversation. That might help. Other people might say, hey, let's go out, let's go grab a cup of coffee and sit out back. Oh. Maybe you don't even kind of address the upset you just say hey let's go try this or let's take redirection a yeah read or and sometimes you just like simply suggest like hey why don't you why don't you take a break and go up and lay down or, or watch a movie or we have people that do some of those like coloring books or, mm -hmm. or, or different apps use the calm app or or someone might say I'm not upset and I say why don't we just use the app and it might sh you know give them some feedback that they're a little above their baseline and, and yes. so I didn't realize that you know and so then they 
pardon me, are, are more receptive and open to maybe some breathing exercises, for example. Oh, great you know, idea. I was thinking yoga. Yeah, yoga is yoga's terrific. And, and things you can do in the, on the spot are important because oftentimes, you know, self-management begins with taking breaks and, and bringing yourself back to calm and then re-engaging. But mm -hmm. the goal, of course, for any of us is to be able to stay in that situation and keep going. So some of those things become subtle things that any of us are doing, like breathing or changing our posture if it's a pain or discomfort mm -hmm. issue. So there's a lot of strategies that can, and that document is very much living and breathing and, and sort of, you know, developed over time. I think it remains pretty dynamic. And how long does it take? I know that there's no crystal ball. Sure, But sure. Um, I, I know that you, you identify and you enjoy some mm -hmm. great success at mm -hmm. Remed. How long, what's the path look like? Well, it can, again, it can vary based on the type and severity of injury, right? So, um, and also I think the other things that, that affect that are awareness. If someone kind of comes in and understands what they've been doing hasn't mm -hmm, working or mm -hmm. even takes some time and, exp and build gains from the experience they've had in rehab and realizes that maybe how they're trying to manage things isn't successful. And sometimes in our work that involves drugs and alcohol and those kinds of things or other at-risk behaviors, um, cutting and those kinds of things oh, can goodness. occur. So it can, it can sometimes be really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So depending on what someone's, you know, and also pre-injury. That has something to do with, obviously, that's where we have a history behind us prior to our injuries yes. that brings in, that comes into bear in, in our recovery and our sort of skills and capacities. So all of that, it, it's, you know, and typically we're working with people for several weeks or several months um, at a time, um, if not longer. Get a good, depending good on result and get yeah. them in the right direction. Correct, mm -hmm. correct. And then really, really working hard to make sure that we're educating the folks that are going to take on the next steps, whether, of course, that's spouse and kids and children mm -hmm. and loved ones, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, follow-up maybe treatment teams that are going to be involved, uh, whether that's maybe something like a home health agency or another clinical setting where they're going to go. Mm -hmm. So we really work hard to educate them so they understand as much about this process as possible. That's great. Yeah. And another facet to this, I think, is depression as well. Mm -hmm. I know that we haven't touched on that, but mm -hmm. when we talk about that emotional regulation, mm -hmm. is that a factor sure. in, in that recovery? Yeah, and, and I touched on it only briefly, and I'm glad you, glad you returned to it, Candace. Uh, with respect to medical stability, medications can have a profound impact on someone's recovery. Um, certainly the goal is for them to be stabilizing, but at times they can be, at, you know, they can be sedating. People can be too tired to oh. maybe engage or too fatigued or, or maybe just even like a little groggy or foggy. Mm -hmm. And that can be a medication side effect. There can also be folks who are maybe on an antidepressant because they're presumed to be depressed because they had a brain injury, which certainly follows. But yes. sometimes those can be a little overactivating as an agent, and you get somebody who's a little too um, maybe activated and, and, and animated, I mm -hmm. guess. And that can mm -hmm. look like pressured and other things like mania can come into play. And so it's really important to have the right sort of professionals available um, that are as you know tuned into brain injury as possible to make the right kinds of recommendations and also to have a team that's able to give feedback you know to the person but also to the clinicians and, and the family members about how things are going and whether these changes that have been made were effective or, or potentially not. So when when a brain injury survivor comes to see you, what mm -hmm. would their day look like? Mm -hmm. Is it uh, a full day, a half day, a couple of hours, right. once a week? Right. Tell us what that treatment might look like to sure. get them Great that question. success that they're, they so desperately need. Mm. So in a, in a residential environment, you know, they typically, we're, we're making sure folks have support to get up in the morning and get their medications and, you know, get, get their daily, whether that's a shower in the morning or just kind of get ready for the day. Uh, and then they'll typically have, you know, sessions with therapists, and that might include neuropsychological therapy testing. Um, a lot of evaluations happen in the beginning, as you can imagine. Yes. We really want to get to know as know much to as start. we can. Yeah, absolutely. Really identify the sort of benchmarks and guideposts, which again are framed around that triangle that I mentioned in the beginning, because that really sets the tone for priorities. Oh. Um, so we really have to make sure that everyone, you know, is involved, is, is oriented to the plan and what the priorities are at the moment. So that pace that you mentioned, Candace, can, mm -hmm. can vary. Some folks can tolerate a pretty intense pace and they're, they're ready to go and they seem like they're benefiting from it. Others may Maybe need a more structured breaks um, mm -hmm. and, and sort of like low stim or downtime to make sure that they're not. In addition to physical fatigue, a lot of people in early parts of injury deal with cognitive fatigue, and that can be sort of one of those oh. silent sort of things where you know you it's don't feel tired. It's overwhelming information. Yeah, that you don't feel tired, symptom. but you look tired or you look kind of glazed over, yes. or you're just not. And then at that point, we know that information's not they're not benefiting from it, or we're running the risk of them becoming irritable and agitated. So that's when we might build breaks into their day. So and you can you see know. that. Yeah, you can identify yeah, that. Sure. With somebody well, physically, you yeah. see that uh, their exhaustion, and that's what you really, and that's one of those things where you really look to maybe in the beginning we might impart breaks or suggest or recommend them, but then you really look to shift that over to that individual to say, 
how are you feeling right now? Like, do you think now's a good time for a break? And start to teach them to kind of pay attention to those things, um, whether it relates to pain or, you know, fatigue or, or right. you know, many other things. To get their feedback. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Is this working for yeah, you? Yeah, to get their And I'm body. sure there's sure. measurement tools that you use right. to say, look at the, look how far we've come, because right. I know that when I had a brain injury, that I, it was hard to understand that I was having any, I'm meeting any milestones right. in my recovery. Right. So I think working with a professional, that gives you the opportunity to really pay not only the pace, but you can see in milestones. Right, absolutely. And that looks how like even more, how much more successful your interactions are with your family yeah. or how much more capable you feel managing your day. You know, those can be the things that, you know, might in your previous life didn't seem like such an accomplishment, yes. but certainly yes. as you a part of your recovery, your success. yeah, as a part of your recovery and rehabilitation, they're they're really important things to highlight to say this is this is why we're working on these things and look at the successes that you've had. That's great, yeah. Chris. I'm I'm so thankful that you joined us today, uh, and I know so much, that Candace. all this information is so valuable, and there'll be somebody sure. that's watching us that is sure. just so so excited and engaged and looking forward to getting yeah. the help they needed. Maybe yeah. they didn't recognize it, right. and they right. now they identify it. That that's me. Right. I'm right. having those challenges. Right, right. And this would be a good opportunity for them to take advantage of maybe working with Remed. Yeah, terrific. That, yeah, you know, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, is there any, how, did, how would somebody reach out to you? To get that in, to reach Remed. So I would definitely encourage people to go to the re, the website. That's Remed.com, mm -hmm. uh, where there's a wealth of information about Remed services, which or range from you know I work within the intensive neurobehavioral, but I also can so we have uh, supported living systems. We have an outpatient program. We have a oh variety goodness, of types yes. of services that are home and community based as well, and in New Jersey and in Maryland and in the Philadelphia area. Um, and so I would encourage people to go to the website to just you know peruse Remed services. But there's also links to things like the IAPA. The Brain Injury Association of Pennsylvania or the Brain Injury Association of America that might have you know other resources depending on their location or their needs that I would certainly encourage them to look for. And then there's a 1-800 uh, a line. It's 1-800-84-REMED. That was when we were founded. It was 1984. Oh, so oh perfect. 1-800-84-REMED is a way to get in direct contact with, with you know, and, and talk to someone um, uh, appropriate to your needs at REMED. I appreciate that. Sure. That's great. And if you'd like more information about brain injury, or learn more about the remarkable work of the Mind Your Brain Foundation, please visit www.mindyourbrainfoundation.org. If you would like to see past Mind Your Brain interviews, you can see them on Radnor 21 uh, Station or Mind Your Brain Foundation website. At the bottom of your screen, ReMed can be reached, as we told you. And we welcome any feedback that you might have about this broadcast at info at mindyourbrain.org. Org, mindyourbrainfoundation.org. Thank you.